Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Blessed Virgin Mary, you modeled for us perfect, perfect receptivity to God's will. Help us to imitate you in all things, especially in our worship of the same God, whom you adored in person, from the moment of his conception in your womb to the moment he died on the cross, and now are joined perfectly with him, body and soul, forever with him in the heavenly liturgy. May we never despair of our liturgical expressions here, but might I ever strive more, ever more joyfully to be with you and your Son forever in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to the Oratory Lecture Series. This one is on, it's called Singing Liturgically, the Propers in the History of Sacred Music. As I developed this talk, the history portion became rather condensed because I didn't do as much research on that area and thought about explaining more theology, the spirituality, and the practicalities of what we call the propers. Before we get into like, I was gonna answer like, why this talk, I first wanna explain what we're talking about just so we can be on the same page. When I say propers, it's not immediately apparent to every single Catholic what the word propers means, especially in the context of the liturgy. There's the word proper, and that sounds appropriate in some way, but like, what is that, how does that transfer? How can you make it plural to make it actually mean a noun? What, what are we dealing with? In the liturgy, there are several things that can be chanted. There is the, the order of the mass uh, that is, uh, here, here's a picture of the, the missal, the introductory rite to the missal. These are, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. It's, this is a part of the order of the Mass, along with some of the acclamations. And then also, in addition to that, the, the presidential prayers, when the priest says, let us pray, or something like the preface. Those are parts of the Mass that, are, that are, are sung, that belong to the order of the Mass, or presidential prayers in the Mass. And we're also used to what's called the ordinary of the Mass that which is sung uh, uh, ordinarily. I, the actual name ordinary, um, Father Joshua could probably explain what that, that means um, more fittingly, but it's what's sung every, the text of it is the same every single week. The Kyrie, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison, Christi eleison, Christi eleison. Gloria in excelsis Deo, ad inter pax minibus. We're used to these things, they come up every single mass. And some places, but not with a lot of, of uh, variation. Uh, here we have uh, a selection of uh, so, uh, one of the ma different mass settings of the ordinary of the mass. This is called Misa de Angelis. And we're very familiar with the Gloria because we sing that Gloria all the time. Gloria in excelsis Deo, et in terra pax omnibus. We're used to that. Um, but the Kyrie is uh, a little bit more ornate. Kyrie. Brother Joel, help me out here. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> on a lot more stretched out. We have a lot more melismas, and that is the, the long uh, expressions of many notes coming one after another. Uh, and other parts of the Mass are like that as well in different ordinary settings. What we are used to, especially here at the Oratory, is uh, what was a collection of different parts of different settings that were kind of jammed together, and it's called the Misa Jubilate Deo. And so we have uh, the uh, Kyrie eleison, and that we're used, that's normal. Sanctus, Sanctus, or Agnus Dei. They're taken from different settings, and they're kind of plumped together, and we're used to it because it's easy to be sung every single day, and most congregations can handle it very easily. Those chants belong to the ordinary of the Mass. And then we have what's called the propers. The propers, you can tell by looking at a page in the Roman Missal, this is just a, a screenshot of the Roman Missal uh, from the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time, which would be 
tomorrow or today, liturgically, if you already went to a vigil mass, an anticipated mass. And uh, the propers would correspond here to, say, on here, the entrance antiphon at the top, and then the communion antiphon, which this week there, there are options, and there's reasons for why there's options. But these are the texts here that uh, can be sung, but also can be spoken. So a lot of daily masses, you might hear a priest just speak those antiphons rather than have anyone sing those. Those, uh, those antiphons make up what's called the, the propers. And in particular, for the sake of this lecture, I'm going to focus on the entrance antiphon, or when it's sung, called the introit, and then the offertory antiphon, which is actually not here, and then the communion antiphon, to explain what's going on with those things. Here we see that um, this entrance antiphon is, we'll look at that in particular here, and it corresponds to a simple English uh, melody. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I have called out to you all the day. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, and plenteous in mercy to all who call upon you. It's a simple text, and this text uh, is meant to be sung uh, with a congregation. That's why the melody is pretty easy to kind of catch on to. I would bet if I were to sing it two or three more times, you would all be able to join in pretty easily, especially having the notes in front of you. This English antiphon, which corresponds to the entrance antiphon, is taken from a lot more complicated Latin uh, Gregorian antiphon. Uh, it's the same text, but in Latin. Miserere mici domine. I'll sing it because, why not? Misere mici domine, quoni amante clamavi, tota die, qui antu domine, Notice it's a lot longer, a lot more ornate, a lot more difficult. You cannot put this in front of a group of people that are not used to singing it and just have them sing it. So what happened is we had originally the more complicated Latin one with all the extra notes in there. And then they said, well, we'll give some ones, spoken ones for people to, to just recite. And then recently, within the past 10 years or so, the, uh, the more simple one, have mercy on me, O Lord. This one came out uh, to help and make it easier for congregations and choirs to be able to sing the text of the, the propers of the Mass. Okay, a little complicated. Just a quick note here before we move on, since we have both of these uh, examples in front of us, we can see how each derivation kind of loses something. When it, it's just spoken, have mercy on me, O Lord, for I cry to you all the day long, O Lord, you are good and forgiving, have full of mercy to all who call to you. It is pretty much devoid of any inflection, except for maybe what the priest might put into it. But anything you try to speak with extra inflection becomes really weird, in the liturgy especially. So you lose any inflection, you lose any kind of emphasis. You don't know, like, what is the most important here? What is being stressed? Whereas in the more complex Latin one, you get some really, really cool, like, uh, almost exotic kind of sounding uh, emphases. Et copiosus in misericordia. That oh, et copiosus is this like the, the plenteousness of the mercy kind of explodes for you in like a weird melody. It sticks out. It doesn't sound like most other things you would hear in Gregorian chant, but that emphasizes the, the how abundant God's mercy is. 
something you get from the Latin text that is chanted and its proper ancient Gregorian tune that you don't get when you just go, uh, and plenteous in mercy. It's like, ah, that derivation, you lose information. In math, if you were to, to uh, take a function and you make a derivative of that function, you lose a bit of information. Same thing when you simplify chant. There is so much packed into every single chant, and every, every single Sunday has a new set of proper chants that correspond to the particular mass. These ones for the 22nd Sunday. Next week, we'll have a different set. And it goes on. Each Sunday has its own flavor, its own emphases. And you lose that when you take away some of the complexity. But you gain some other things as well, such as the ability to sing it, which is still a very good thing. <laughs> so it's kind of like you take the good with the bad, and you go forward, and you, you, you try to get some sort of ideal out of this anyway. And I would say it's much better, at least my philosophy is, to do the simple thing well than to try to do the more complicated thing, but to do it poorly. Someone once said, chant was killed because it was sung slowly. I would say chant was killed because it was sung poorly. Too many people thought, oh, I know how to do this. I know what I'm doing. I know what a quilisma is. I know what a perectus is. Therefore, I can sing this. Well, those are the names of these kind of funny notes in this thing. Well, so what if you don't actually know the relationship between one note and another, the intervals? If you sing it in such a sloppy way where there's no devotion, like, then so what? You might as well sing the text that you can comprehend and sing it well rather than do something in Latin uh, that will just come across as esoteric and not pleasing to the ear. <laughs> now, of these, there's, essentially, I made three categories of things that we sing in Mass. The order of Mass, along with like acclamations and other, uh, the dialogue of the Mass, um, kind of thrown in that, too, is the presidential prayers, which maybe is a separate category, but that's okay. It's, people don't sing those. So that's okay. That's just the priest. Uh, then you have the ordinary, the Kyrie, the Gloria, the Song to Day. Um, and then you have the category of the propers. What's missing here is the category of hymns. We're very used to having hymns now in our liturgical experience, especially of the Mass. You begin Mass with an entrance hymn. You have an offertory hymn. You have a communion hymn, and you have a closing hymn. And sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're OK. Sometimes they're not so good. And there's a definitely varying qualities of hymns out there. <laughs> but that's not, hymns are not something that, properly speaking, belong to the Mass. There's room for hymns in the Roman Catholic tradition, a, a very deep uh, space that they occupy with a, a lot of profundity, and that is in the, uh, the Liturgy of the Hours. Hymns were sung liturgically by those that are praying the Liturgy of the Hours. So in morning prayer, you'd pray a, a hymn that was designated for that day, uh, for that saint, or whatever it might be you might be celebrating at daytime prayer, at, at evening prayer, at night prayer, at officer readings. There's, each one of these has hymns associated with it. It's a little bit flexible now about what hymns you can do in those hours, but they, that's where the hymns properly go. And we can talk a little bit about the history a little bit later, about how it came to be that we ended up with what church musicians lamentably call the four hymn sandwich of the entrance, offertory, communion, closing hymn. And that's exactly what the organist plays every single week. That's what the choir sings. And there's not way to get, no way to get out of that. How we got there is a little bit interesting. And there's probably a lot of nuances that I'm not going to capture in my attempt to go over that. So, but an example of a hymn, and what separates a hymn from something like a chant uh, is that chant, the, the words are matched to the tune. The tune is fitted to the words, rather. First, you have the text. In this case, you have this text of Psalm 85 or slash 86, depending on what kind of numeration of the psalms you use. And that's a different topic. We're not going to get into that. Uh, there's a lot of liturgical rabbit holes. <laughs> so you have to avoid those. Uh, so Psalm 85, uh, this is a text from there. Have mercy on me, O Lord. Okay. Uh, and it's a scriptural text that's given sort of its own life through chant. The tunes correspond, the jumps, the Et it's, a, it's a living text. And the, there's no way you could just take anything else, especially not in a different language, and just match it on there to, to that same tune and have it work. It doesn't. The text and the tune go together. But if you looked at something like a hymn, 
like one of my favorite hymns, the Ave Maria Stella. Ave Maria Stella, Dei Mater Ama, Arque Semper Virgo, Felix Celi Porta, Sumen Zilur Ave, Gabrieli Sore, Funda Nos in Pace, Mutans Even Omen. Oh, it's beautiful. Hail, star of the sea, kindly mother of God and ever virgin, happy gate of heaven. Receiving that Ave from the mouth of Gabriel, establishing us, establish us in peace, changing the name of Eva. It's a Latin creativity thing going on there. Ave becomes Eva. So it's like that's a very beautiful poetic expression of what Mary does, undoes what Eve got wrong. And it's like, oh, so beautiful. And you would look at something like this, and oh, say, that's Gregorian chant. Stella, look at that. There's like all these notes in a row. You got you even got a coalisma here. <laughs> Virgo, that's a coalisma. We're doing Gregorian chant. It, well, yeah, it is a Gregorian, it is a Gregorian hymn, but is it properly speaking chant? No, because you notice that the words in the first verse are different than the words in the second verse, but the tune is the same, it's repeated. And so there is a little bit of a, the, the words are unmoored from the tune uh, that it goes with. Sometimes there might be a nice happy accident of an emphasis falling within uh, the way that the, the tune is structured uh, in order to create a, you know, and there is. I mean, there's amazing um, poeticism to this, these Latin texts and how they correspond with the tunes, but they're hymns. And something like this would belong probably you know, somewhere in the devotional life of the church or somewhere in the uh, liturgy of the hours. Uh, and it would maybe go in a mass to supplement some of the other parts of the mass that are, that are sung. Um, but that's, uh, its proper place is, is not in the mass. Okay, so that's pretty much a long 15-minute introduction to what we're talking about. We're talking about propers. We're talking about those more simple ones that I showed you, uh, but also how they're based in the Gregorian ones that are more complicated. And this is a, a picture of the book that I, I pull from, uh, mostly out of convenience. I think there might be slightly better versions nowadays that I have not yet tapped into, called Simple English Propers, composed and edited by Adam Bartlett. And the reason why I wanted to talk about why this whole lecture is happening uh, First, I wanted to address something that is just kind of been present in the liturgies here more and more, um, maybe because of my own preferences in some ways, but also the, a desire to sing the Mass more and more. Uh, and oftentimes, uh, since uh, taking, um, uh, becoming uh, more involved with the choir, uh, back, I guess that would be two years ago now or something like that, uh, I... Um, like doing more of these simple English propers so that the congregation can sing along, so you can understand what we're doing. But I know it's not clear where these things are coming from, why they're being sung, why it's, we're doing this instead of doing a processional hymn, why we're doing this. Oftentimes, if you go to the 11 a.m. mass, the, uh, there's no offertory hymn. We're, we're used to offertory hymns. Why not do a good old, let all mortal flesh keep silence? Because that's a really, really awesome hymn. But no, we're doing something random. Maybe sometimes it's a little bit harder to sing. Maybe sometimes the choir is not that good. <coughs> Sorry about that. And I wanted to be able to explain what is happening there. And then other times, in Sunday Masses, it's like, well, if I know the propers and I can sing them, I'll do that and I'll opt to do a proper instead of doing an opening hymn. Uh, so like 5.15 or 4 o'clock Mass today, I just sang the uh, entrance antiphon on the way in because it's part of the liturgy. Might as well sing it instead of just speaking it. And it's, there's not a need necessarily for a hymn in that case. So I wanted to be able to explain what's going on there. But I also want to get people to have an idea of what the church really envisions as uh, how liturgy is supposed to work with music. When we go to a church and our experience of the liturgy is it's affected by several things. One thing is when we first walk in, the architecture. You have good architecture and you have bad architecture. You have architecture that's interesting, but maybe not conducive to prayer. You have architecture that's conducive to prayer, but maybe not that ornate. A lot of different ways in which the architecture affects our experience of the Mass and as our experience of the space in which we pray. But then when the Mass starts, well, if you hear a piano right away, 
it automatically, like, oh, I guess it's gonna be one of those kinds of masses. We hear a guitar, it's like, oh, it's gonna be one of those kinds of masses. <laughs> we hear organ, we're like, okay, uh, okay, it's gonna be one of those. And we hear a Gregorian chant, it's like, whoa, how did I stumble upon this? And our experience of the music is like one of the biggest factors of any mass. I notice this as a priest when I go into a random place to celebrate mass, it's not like, there's a lot of things outside of my control, which is kind of frustrating for a priest, or at least for me, to be someone who wants to be in control of things, like, oh, you know, I, I was at a place uh, for uh, um, uh, Corpus Christi this year, and um, the choir director came up to me in the sacristy and said, okay, we're not gonna do the sequence. I'm like, oh, okay. I guess that's fine, I guess you just you could just do that. Uh, and like, uh, I'm like, oh, I have no control here. But then like, okay, what, how good is the singing? Maybe not that good. Maybe the congregation's not that good. Maybe the selection's pretty poor. Maybe the, the quality of the text is really, really weak and watered down. And this affects us one way or the other. We might get used to it over a long period of time. I know growing up, my liturgical music experience, I mean, in some ways wasn't bad. The, the, uh, the, the cantor, for the most part, for a lot of my time growing up, was actually an amazing <coughs> vocalist. Really awesome voice. Uh, he was very talented uh, on the piano. <laughs> And so in some ways we were blessed to have that, but it definitely affected my experience of the Mass because I wasn't getting a lot of spiritual depth from the hymns. And I thought, well, maybe I'm just supposed to like them because it's Catholic. And I didn't know there was so much more. I didn't know that scripture can come alive in this way through Gregorian chant. And so no matter what, we see that music affects our experience of the liturgy. So what does the church envision with music? What does it envision with singing? How are we supposed to approach that as congregations that are here? Do we sing? Or are we supposed to sing well? How much influence do we have? Sometimes not that much. Sometimes it's just lamentable that we have to deal with it. Uh, but still, it's good for us to know, like, how should we approach this? And how does the church, church approach, approach this? And one of the biggest distinctions you'll see now is the uh, difference between singing at Mass and singing the Mass. One of the things that's uh, emphasized in using the propers as opposed to hymns, or maybe him, uh, hymns supplementing the propers, is that by singing the propers and singing the ordinary, and maybe other parts as well, there, you are singing the Mass itself. It is not just an addition. It's not a, an accident in the way that Thomas Aquinas considers accidents, such as something that does not belong intrinsically to it. It actually does belong to it. The church sees the most solemn form of celebrating mass with all the smells and the bells and the, the music as the, the norm that everything else kind of follows from. And I was showing you the, the more complex Gregorian Latin chant. In some way, the, the way we celebrate mass is influenced by the more solemn way we can celebrate mass. Maybe it might be beyond our reach to always do the very complicated Gregorian proper, in this case, miserere miki domine, but we can at least have what, how we celebrate Mass be influenced and informed by what the church sees as more or less the pinnacle of the Roman Rite. Let's get a little bit into kind of the theology of the liturgy in general and see how maybe we can see how chant fits into that, and in particular how the propers fit into that. We're going to look at the, uh, the document from the Second Vatican Council called Sacro Sanctum Concilium. This is the document that kind of set the stage for all the liturgical form that was supposed to happen. When people talk about Vatican II changing things and Vatican II making all these differences in the liturgy, well, they're actually not talking about this document because this document is awesome. It's like really good. There are so many solid principles here. A lot of them are correcting abuses. A lot of them are calling the, the church, all the faithful, to a deeper immersion in the liturgical mysteries. It's a culmination of a lot of effort by a lot of people to bring the faithful to understand what they are participating in, to draw them into a deeper participation. And the seventh chapter, the seventh section of Sacro Sanctum Concilium is considered the core of the document. This paragraph, which we're, I'm gonna read in full, uh, is like, if we internalize this, we will understand what we're doing when we go to mass. We're gonna understand what we're doing when we pray night prayer by ourselves or in community. We're gonna understand what it means to enter into Eucharistic adoration even more if we really internalize this paragraph. To accomplish so great a work, Christ is always present in his church, especially in her liturgical celebrations. He is present in the sacrifice of the mass, 
not only in the person of his minister, the same now offering through the ministry of priests who formerly offered himself on the cross, but especially under the Eucharistic species. By his power, he is present in the sacraments, so that when a man baptizes, it is really Christ himself who baptizes. He is present in his word, since it is he himself who speaks when the Holy Scriptures are read in the church. He is present, lastly, when the church prays and sings. For he promised, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Christ indeed always associates the church with himself in this great work, wherein God is perfectly glorified and men are sanctified. The church is his beloved bride who calls to her Lord and through him offers worship to the eternal Father. Rightly then, the liturgy is considered as an exercise of the priestly office of Jesus Christ. Things I want to emphasize here. Christ is present lastly when the church prays and sings. Christ is present when we sing. He's present when we sing liturgically. He's present when we use the words of the liturgy and we bring them to life in ourselves and in the context of uh, the communion of all the faithful there. And then it says here, God is uh, perfectly glorified and men are sanctified. Here we have the, what's called the dual mediation of Christ. Christ is the mediator between heaven and earth. Everything that God wants to give us comes through Christ, and everything we want to give God, mainly ourselves, goes through Christ. It is a dual mediation. It is the mediation between heaven, and, heaven to earth and earth to heaven. Christ stands as that bridge. It is a two-way bridge that he operates, bringing heaven down to earth and earth up to heaven. And when we pray liturgically, Christ is present with us in both senses. In the way that God is glorified, bringing earth up to heaven, where we glorify God by our worship of him, and men are sanctified, God comes down to heaven, from heaven to earth. The dual mediation of Christ is what the liturgy accomplishes. And when we participate in the liturgy, when all the faithful participate in the liturgy, they participate in Christ's priesthood, his mediation. The priesthood of the faithful is a real thing. It's not something invented by Vatican II. It's something that all of us are baptized into Christ the priest. Some of us are ordained and configured to Christ even further to be stand in his place as ministerial priests in the context of the liturgy. But all of us and the priesthood of the faithful are mediating with Christ the mediator. We are brought to Christ. Christ is brought to us. We bring Christ to the world. It is Christ's priesthood working in us. And when we pray liturgically, it's Christ the priest working in us. And then we hear, kind of expressing this in a few uh, paragraphs later, the liturgy is the summit toward which the activity of the church is directed. At the same time, it is the font from which all her power flows. When we've heard about the liturgy being the source and summit of the Christian life, this is where people take that from. That is a paraphrase of that, uh, this paragraph right here. It is the summit and it is the font. It is that which everything is aiming for. It is that which everything, every good thing comes. It is both. And that is the dual mediation of Christ expressed for us in the liturgical action. In, uh, in particular, we can see that the, the words that we use in the liturgy are not just words that are about God, even words derived from Scripture that are about His revelation, but they are actually more properly speaking words from God and words to God. They are words united to Christ the Word that became flesh. And so it is both from God and to God, the dual mediation that happens there. And chant is now participation through the words that come alive, through the singing of the text in the context of the church. It is a participation in that. We notice that one thing that characterizes liturgical prayer that's separate from maybe other kinds of prayer is that it is something given to us. It is not something we create for ourselves. When we look at the text, and we can go back to, to the, the page of the Missal for the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time, it gives you the text. The entrance antiphon, the introit, have mercy on me, O Lord. The, the collect is something the priest prays. He doesn't have a lot of leeway there. There's nothing that says in these or similar words. These words are given to the priest to say. These words are given to the people for them to hear, but also for them to participate in as well, fully, actively, consciously, in the words of Vatican II. 
So this way, it is something given to us. In other kinds of prayer, prayer is sometimes something we kind of invent on the spot, or at least it can feel like that. Spontaneous prayer, the pouring of ourselves out before God. We say, God, help me. I'm really dealing with a lot of struggles right now, and I need your assistance. And this person, I'm really, I really care about this person. Can you help them? And it's all our words, all our concerns expressed to God. And that's, that's good. That should be the way that we pray. But it's even better when it's infused with Scripture. When we turn to something like the Psalms, the prayer book of Christ, the prayer book of the Old Testament, the prayer book of the church, and we find in those Psalms the perfect expression, unto you, Lord, I lift up my soul. Do not let me hope in vain. Like, ah, yes, those aren't my words. Those are the words of Christ that he uttered. Those are the words that Mary prayed over and over again as she abandoned herself to the love of the Father. These are our words now, and they are sanctifying for us when we pray them in union with the church. And this comes from the sort of the principle that the way in which we, uh, you think that like we have a system of beliefs, we have scripture, we have the, the magisterium that presents everything for us, organizes it and makes it clear as much as possible. And uh, we, what we do is we take what we believe and we express it in prayer. And the church gives us this expression of what we believe in the way that we pray. And that means that the way in which we believe affects the way we pray. And that makes sense. You know, I wouldn't pray to the Blessed Virgin Mary as if she was the fourth person of the Trinity. Because she's not, naturally. You know, that, that wouldn't make any sense. Uh, but however, it's actually the opposite. There's an expression, uh, it goes lex orandi, lex credendi. Which in Latin means, the law of prayer is the law of belief. The way in which we pray, then, affects the way in which we believe. Prayer comes first. A great example of this, and it might be a little bit superficial, but looking at the early church, how do we know that the early church believed in purgatory? How do we know they believed in the resurrection of the body and all these other things, and that those, souls that, uh, those bodies that were buried, were, uh, need to be, those souls need to be prayed for? We look at the record of their prayer. Peter, pray for I don't know, Andrew or something like that. Like, it's like written in the catacombs. These early Christians writing these prayers to these saints. We have both the, the, the communion of the saints at work. So we have that belief expressed in prayer and also the belief in praying for the dead. Recognizing that there is something of a purgatory. That they need to be delivered from and be forgiven of their sins and to be brought into the fullness of God's life in heaven. All of that is contained in that prayer, which informs how we believe. And this is because it, prayer is something given to us. Christ says the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will teach you how to pray. Ever wonder how that works? How is the Holy Spirit teaching us how to pray? The Holy Spirit is alive in the traditions of the church. The Holy Spirit teaches us through liturgical prayer. What has been passed down from generation to generation is now being received by us in order to be handed down further to other generations. We are recept receptive first to what God is doing in us, and then we respond and our participation in that prayer. And that, that kind of shows, like, in a, in a way that the, uh, uh, like, the way that which we, uh, Protestants actually approach this, they reverse it. They decided they're not going to be Catholic, they're going to have their own system of beliefs. They said transubstantiation doesn't work. We have different beliefs also about predestination. We have different beliefs about the depravity of human nature. We have our beliefs, and we're going to pray like that. So they said, lex credendi, Lex Orandi. And they end up with a kind of a, maybe not as a developed a prayer life. It's the way it's, it's not as informed by the tradition that's been handed on. It's been invented at some point in time. And to be fair, a lot of our vernacular hymns, a lot of what we have in English, are kind of carryovers from the Protestant tradition. Where they say, we believe this, therefore we're going to pray this. A lot of things aren't bad. I mean, like Amazing Grace. What a wonderful hymn, an expression of confidence in God's, uh, in God's mercy and his grace. And, uh, you know, that's okay, fine in some ways. But, uh, like, un the undertones there uh, save a wretch like me. Like, oh, I don't know if, like, are we playing it into the, the belief of the, um, the depravity of human nature here? It's like, ah, uh, maybe a little bit because we know it's, it's source. Um, Catholic hymns, they don't have that problem. It's born out of the life of the church at prayer. It's developed over time, organically growing up over, uh, over time. Uh, it's in order to, to fit our, uh, our expression of it even better. Uh, and it is a better expression of what we believe because it's handed down to us, not something we grasp at and invent. 
So I'd like to uh, just to finish this off as saying if our liturgical prayer is fundamentally receptive, so, so will our faith be. We'll be properly submissive in all the right kinds of ways to God's revelation of himself. And then the thing that follows is we will live that way accordingly. If we pray receptively, we will believe receptively, and we will act receptively. And then going into the content of what we pray, the same thing would follow, looking at each individual thing. Like looking at the taunt to Mergo, that is something we pray every single time. We have benediction. And we look at those words, we let those seep in, we believe as we pray, and then we act as if everything we've said, uh, we prayed is true, and it should be life transforming. Lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. The law of prayer is the law of faith, which is the law of life. That's why this matters so much. So if you pray like a Catholic, you believe like a Catholic, you live like a Catholic, if you pray liturgically, receptive, if you pray and sing with the fullness of who you are as a person, putting yourself in there, not just the words, but even the intonations, the, the intervals, the, the time that spends, uh, you spend on each note, everything is drawing something out of you so that you might believe everything more accordingly. So when you're praying something like, I don't know how it goes, oh, I should have it in front of me if I'm gonna try to sing it. But if you pray something like that, then you're gonna believe it more. Unto you have I lifted up my soul, and you, O oh Lord, I trust. Do not let me trust in vain. And it prints that belief more on the heart when we pray this liturgically and chant it with who we are as human beings that are made not just to recite words, but to, to live them out in a way and through music. Just a few more comments on the reason, uh, some words from Tacto uh, Sacrosanctum Concilium on the importance of the musical tradition. Musical tradition of the universal church is a treasure of inestimable value, greater even than that of any other art. The main reason for this preeminence is that as sacred song united to the words, it forms a necessary or integral part of the solemn liturgy. A necessary or integral part of the solemn liturgy. Therefore, sacred music is to be considered the more, more holy in proportion as it is more closely connected with the liturgical action. That's an important principle. If something is happening liturgically, there is a procession. The servers are, and the priests are entering the sanctuary. They're incensing the holy altar in preparation for what is about to happen there. It makes sense that the chant that is made for that, that is meant to accompany that, is sung. When the gifts are being brought up to the, off, uh, to the altar, the offertory, there is a chant that is set aside for that so that all of our attention is not just gonna be buried in a hymnal, but now carried over to what is happening on the altar. And it adds a little bit of a flavor, a, a way of approaching that, well, what is to happen there in the offertory. In the communion procession, when we're going up to receive our Lord and Holy Communion, it's usually a text of the gospel of that day that is being chanted over and over again. So the same Christ we've heard proclaimed in the gospel is now giving himself to us in Holy Communion. These propers are fitted for the liturgical action. And if we follow this principle, sacred music is to be considered the more holy in proportion as it is more closely connected with the liturgical action. Then the propers being sung would take priority. Now you can do other things too, it's not necessarily wrong. We're not talking about if someone sings a hymn instead of doing a proper, it's not the worst thing ever. We're in some ways presenting the ideal and how the church wanted the mass to be celebrated uh, in order to understand how we can maybe work from that and draw out the practicalities. We have limitations a lot of times. A lot of congregations are not that good at singing. A lot of priests are not that good at singing. You know, you just heard me mess up. Uh, you know, um, a lot of, you know, you don't always have the resources for choirs. Uh, and sometimes the, the solemnity of the mass might be a little bit more muted because it's a 9 p.m. mass on a Tuesday. You know, like you can't always, always do this. Um, but in some way you can see how you know, the principle is there, it can inform even the more simple celebration of the Mass. And it should also inform how we participate as members of the faithful. So why sing? I already started talking about that a little bit, but I have a little quote from Ephesians. Be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart. And I have this great quote from Ratzinger, uh, Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger and Pope Benedict, no, just Father Benedict. 
When man comes into contact with God, mere speech is not enough. Areas of his existence are awakened that spontaneously turn into song. And here, Ratzinger sort of echoes some of the words of Augustine, where he says, well, people were often quote Augustine and say, he who sings prays twice. But Augustine's more of saying, like, I, whatever, I don't know where that was from. I don't think it actually is Augustine. If someone found it, you have to let me know. But Augustine says, no, it's a, an expression of a lover to sing. When we come into contact with a God who loves us, the most fitting response is song. It is words that are alive, words that carry us with them to the heights of heaven and allow us to be sanctified by God who acts in our souls. These areas of our existence need to be awakened. And insofar as we have immuted expressions of these things, we never enter into the beauty of the liturgy. We have no idea what God can accomplish through the holy words of Mother Church sung beautifully and echoing in our hearts. I want to go through a brief history now a little bit uh, to talk about uh, sort of the history of sacred music. It's not the most fun part of it. I have this long quote from St. Clement. And um, in the early part of the church, well, let's go back. There was singing going back all the way to the temple. Uh, the first, uh, some of the first mentions of singing actually go back further than that. Miriam singing at the, uh, the splitting of the Red Sea and the conquering of uh, Pharaoh and his armies and his charioteers. Uh, the song of Miriam is uh, like one of the first songs in all of the Bible. Uh, the singing then uh, ended up becoming more formalized, and David was known as a great psalmist, writing many, many songs. He was a harpist. He played. He accompanied with music and instruments. And these were things that ended up being sung within the temple that Solomon had constructed. It was part of the, the worship of uh, the people of Israel in Jerusalem. It also became stretched out to their, their worship in the synagogues, different places, um, especially you see by the time of Christ, and we're skipping over a lot of history, uh, that the synagogues would have their own worship uh, and their own way of singing, especially the songbook of the Old Testament, the Psalms. And very likely, you know, a lot, a lot of them would have these things memorized and the tunes uh, that go with them, they would, they would be, be part of them. The, the tune would go, be so married with the text, it would just be something they could easily come back to. Just like how we can remember secular song lyrics because of the catchy tune, same thing, um, but a little more profound with uh, the, the Psalms and uh, the Old Testament and the time of Christ. In addition to, there was also a, a, a home liturgy of sorts where maybe they would try to sing as well. After the destruction of the temple, uh, they had speculated at least that the, they didn't sing as much. The use of instruments was muted and didn't happen as much. Uh, and uh, the use of instruments in music became something associated with pagans. Pagans would have music, and it would be for immoral purposes. They would try to draw people into uh, greater and more unnatural forms of, of lust. Uh, it, was, it, was not, it was, had such a bad immoral connotation, any of these instruments, that St. Clement of Alexandria took the, all the instruments that were talked about in the Psalms, uh, you know, lyre and harp, praise the Lord, and all these, all these other instruments that are mentioned, timbrels and cymbals and whatnot, uh, and he said he anthropologized them. He made them expressive of the human person. The spirit to purify the divine liturgy from any such unrestrained revelry, such as the pagans, chants, praise him with the sound of trumpet, for in fact at the sound of the trumpet the dead will rise again. Praise him with harp, for the tongue is a harp of the Lord. And with the lute praise him, understand the mouth as a lute moved by the spirit, as the lute by, is by the plectrum. Don't know what that is. Praise him with timbal and choir, that is the church awaiting the resurrection of the body and the flesh, which is its echo. Praise him with strings and organ, calling our bodies an organ and his sinews strings. For from them the body derives its coordinated movement, and when touched by the spirit gives forth human sounds. Praise him on high sounding cymbals, which mean the tongue of the mouth, which with, which with the movement of the lips produces words. The human body then was seen as the perfect instrument for expressing the music of the soul. And the use of instruments became something very muted uh, and not, not used very much. Uh, in the Western church, they started doing more what's called cantillation, sort of like singing something in a musical way. They became more and more developed at different points, developing of monasteries, communities that would pray singing together, uh, and other parts, you know, there's the, the Gallican influences, and there's the Roman influences, there's the standardization of the liturgy, and then there's the, all this is happening in the first 
1,000 years of the church. And by the time you get to about 1,000 AD, a little bit after that, a lot of what we call the propers and their full Gregorian complicatedness already had some kind of form. Maybe it wasn't consistent from monastery to monastery, but it was something that was now being prayed and being lived, maybe not in most parishes, but at least lived in the, uh, the, the opus day of the church expressed, in especially Benedictine monasticism. And then there's a lot you can say about Cluny mon monasteries, and they're spreading throughout Europe, kind of revitalizing culture in a lot of ways, but also carrying on the tradition of chant. And that kind of kept us alive. Renaissance happens, and there's kind of like a, um, this idea of like introducing more and more harmonies into the chant. Uh, this idea of polyphony, having different lines of chant kind of interspersed to kind of get this like folding in action of different voices, kind of expression of these heavenly realities, and it sounds amazingly beautiful. And they in some ways started to become, become more of a preference for that. Uh, more devotional hymns started coming in. Um, and you look at like the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, and you're not necessarily seeing the proper sung all the time in every place. More often, they're singing hymns, hymns they know, hymns they understand, and not even necessarily the Gregorian hymns of the office in Latin, but maybe and you see a lot more, over time, introduction of vernacular hymns at different points in the liturgy. Uh, in 1958, apparently, there was, a, uh, there was permission, it was probably reiterated from times before that. I don't know the full scope of the history there. And I'm being very, very, uh, just very quick overview of history here. Uh, there is a rule saying that you can substitute hymns in, in uh, instead of singing the propers. In 1969, this is after, well after Sacro Santo Concilium, after they've already allowed vernacular into the Missal, so we have already have English Masses, and they're working on making a new Missal. And they have a lot of, uh, they're putting a lot of things together, a lot of resources. You get the, the uh, introduction more Eucharistic prayers. You get the simplification of a lot of different elements of the liturgy, all for the purpose, really, of evangelizing more. The thought was to simplify a lot would help more people understand. If more understood, we'd be able to reach out a lot more and gather a lot more in. It's uh, the judgment of history whether that worked out exactly well and, and what other factors might have been involved in that. Uh, but that was a lot of the approach. But one thing they seemed to not back down on it was that the liturgy properly is meant to be sung. It was meant to be sung. And so someone said, what about this permission to sing hymns instead of propers? And the concilium, concilium the, the one that set up the, all the liturgical changes, headed by the, the, uh, the boogeyman of the liturgical uh, 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 reform, uh, Anna, Annabale Bonini, who if you talk to traditionalists, they don't like him at all. Uh, <laughs> But this is what this concilium gave back. And they said, can we do these hymns instead of these propers? They said, that rule permitting vernacular hymns has been superseded. What must be sung is the mass. It's ordinary and proper, not something, no matter how consistent, that is imposed on the mass. Because the liturgical service is one, it has only one countenance, one motif, one voice, the voice of the church. To continue to replace the text of the Mass being celebrated with motets that are reverent and devout, yet out of keeping with the Mass of the day, amounts to continuing an unacceptable ambiguity. It is to cheat the people. The liturgical song involves not mere melody of words, text, thought, and the sentiments that the poetry and music contain. Thus, texts must be those of the Mass, not others. And singing means singing the Mass, not just singing during Mass. So the question, can you do hymns instead? This answer was no. Now, things change. We have the general instruction of the Roman Missal, and they do allow for other options. That's not a problem. But at that time, 1969, this commission that was doing these liturgical reforms said, the idea is to sing the Mass. We weren't going to be equipped at that time to sing the Mass. We did not have the simple English propers. We were not ready to sing the full Gregorian propers. There are a lot of resources that were not there yet. They were hoping, the council was hoping would be developed, but maybe just weren't in time. A lot of things happened there. But what ended up happening was that the same tendency to sing hymns ended up making its way into now what we call the ordinary form of the Mass, the, the, uh, uh, the Novus Ordo that was promulgated by Paul VI in 1969 that became uh, available for us in English in 1970 that we've been used to ever since. And parishes everywhere have been following the standard hymn model ever since, sometimes imposing things such as songs and things that are not even the structure of hymns, 
that maybe lack even more sacrality, uh, that don't have the sacramentality of the chant and don't even have the hinted sacramentality of the, of the, the hymns. Uh, and there's a lot of abuses that came about through uh, people was exploiting different permissions and uh, sometimes going the wrong direction. Which puts us in where we are today, where we have, we now we have more resources available to us. We can look back and see the intention of the church and the, the, that the church desires the mass to be sung. And in particular, I'm focusing just on this, the propers and why we might sing those instead of hymns or in, in supplement to hymns or along with hymns. Uh, and why they're even spoken it's a lot of places. You know, even just having them spoken is better than not having them at all. Um, not, a, not having them at all is actually, I, as far as I know, perfectly allowed. You don't have to have them. But it seems to be in the mind of the church that they are part of the liturgy. The three that we're looking at, the propers of uh, the introit, uh, or the entrance antiphon, uh, the offertory, and the communion, we can look a little bit at the general instruction of their own missal, which... You can see here, it says there uh, in the middle of 48, it talks about this entrance chant there in 47, but then it says, there are four options for the entrance chant. Number one, the antiphon from the Missal or the antiphon with its psalm from the Graduale Romanum, which is the, the book with all the complicated Latin ones, as set to the music there or in another setting. The antiphon and, gradu and psalm of the Graduale Simplex for the liturgical time, uh, which is a simple version of the Latin one, a chant from another collection of psalms and antiphons approved by the Conference of Bishops or the Diocesan Bishop, including psalms arranged in response or all metrical forms, or four, another liturgical chant that is suited to the sacred action of uh, the day or the time of the year, similarly approved by the Conference of Bishops or the Diocesan Bishop. So those are the options we have for that. Within this, uh, the simple English propers somehow kind of fit with one, but their translation, so they're, I don't know exactly how they fit in there in, that, in those four, but I think they're pretty close to either one or two in terms of the preference of the church, what should be sung. Remembering that the Gregorian chant always has pride of place, and even more simplified forms of Gregorian chant would still have more pride of place than other suitable chants. With the, um, the introit, there's a lot that happens there uh, in terms of just like what, uh, let's see, like what is happening with the introit. The first words of the Mass are not in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. They are the words of the entrance antiphon or the introit. And it used to be that the mass took its name from the, uh, the first words that were sung. For example, you guys know about Gaudete Sunday. That comes from the introit, Gaudete. <laughs> Gaudete in Domino Semper. It's a little bit different than what you expect. Rejoice, the Lord always rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. And it's like, actually, it's a little more like mysterious sounding. It's not very jubilant. It's just. It's like, it's more like a yearning, you know? Like, how do you, you would not expect to, these sentiments created by just the, the chant that I'm not singing the very well right here, uh, but joined with that text is not something you would expect, but it sort of informs like what this is. We're in a penitential time, or we're still crying out, rejoice in the Lord always. It's a suffering intermixed with the joy. It's the joy we experience here on this earth, where there is still suffering among us, longing out for when that joy will be complete. All that's contained within these words. And a little bit, you can see how the English version sort of tries to reflect that a little bit. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your forbearance be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. It's like, it's subdued. It's not triumphant. And so the way this is sung, even in a simple English form, informs how we're supposed to approach that Mass, <clears throat> that pink Sunday of Advent. When we, do, when we hear the introit, we're passing into a different kind of time. It's our indication that this chronological, day-to-day, -day, anxiety-ridden existence that, of, that we live in, we're leaving that behind. We're entering the heavenly time, the kairos of God, the now of God. 
This eternity is expressed by the regularity every single year, only once a year, but every single year we hear the words gaudete, or in this case, rejoice. And it evokes for us the same sentiments we had last Advent and the Advent before. The Advent before it invokes for us this feeling of suffering with joy. And it carries so much within that, that that yearly repetition allows us to approach again and again that mystery, letting it imprint deeper and deeper on us. The way these chants work, being so regularized and being set for us without any variation, allow, these, uh, allow this to become sort of a liturgical Lexio Divina. And when we do Lexio Divina, that is the, the, word, the, the fancy Latin words for praying the scriptures, where you pray a passage and you repeat, and you repeat, and you repeat. You let those words of the text kind of imprint themselves on your heart through, through repeated praying of them, sitting with them, resting with them. That, med, that repetition in Latin is meditatio. It's accomplished through the regularity of the yearly approach to these same exact words, sung in the same exact way. It's the whole church praying Lexio Divina together in order to draw benefit for all of its members. Let's look at the offertory briefly. Uh, this is again from the, the general instruction for the Roman Missal, by the way, is all the rules that govern how the, uh, the Mass is to be celebrated. So the priest can't just do whatever he wants. He has to follow what's said here. Uh, it's not always exactly clear what, you know, sometimes it's not as clear as you want it to be, but it does give you things to do. So you can't just go willy-nilly changing things. You're not allowed to do that. You're, you're just not. Yeah, you, um, the priest has to follow this insofar as possible. Um, and there are some things that are, you can't not do. You can't just skip the collect, the let us pray prayer in the beginning of Mass. You just can't do it. Other things like, oh, do you have to say the entrance antiphon? Not necessarily. Do you have to sing the Alleluia? No, you don't have to do that. So you don't, you, do you have to do a homily? Well, not on weekdays. Technically, you don't have to. It's good, but you don't have to. So there's a lot of things like that that are optional, and for one reason or another, you might or might not do them. Uh, and the propers in some way belong to what's allowed as optional, but in some ways are intrinsic. So it's like that weird tension, like, it belongs to the core of the mass, but it, you don't have to do it. So it's nice when we can do it, right? So the offertory accompanies this procession of the bringing up of the gifts, of the bread of the wine that the priest is there offering on that altar by being placed on that altar is being set aside for whole, something holy, for consecration. And uh, so the procession bringing in the gifts is accompanied by the offertory chant, which continues at least until the gifts have been placed on the altar. And then there's norms for this, apparently. Interesting thing, though, as we look at the Missal again, 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time, we see an entrance antiphon and a collect, and then a prayer of the offerings, a communion antiphon, but wait a second, where's the offertory antiphon? It's not there. There's no option for speaking an offertory antiphon. I looked up the reasoning for this, and apparently the uh, Bunini, the guy that no one really likes in the liturgical, uh, you know, the liturgical police nowadays, said that it would be textual overload if we had an offertory antiphon. Like, what? Like, we, well, whatever. So he doesn't want, they don't want us to speak it for some reason, so it's not available and whatever. It's not there, but it is there in other books that are meant for the mass. So what we can do is something just like, just, Throw that in there, <laughs> uh, which is still there. It's in the general instruction of the Roman Missal to have an offertory antiphon. So on Sundays here at the oratory, we'll, we'll sing an offertory antiphon, and we'll cover the entire offertory action, not just the placing on the altar, but it could, could even continue. And for the rest of the offering of the, the bread and the wine, the incensing of the altar and the washing of hands. Uh, that way, people can participate if they want. And something that I would like to do more, and uh, now that we might get back into having more of a more of a regular choir, less of this haphazard, just kind of throwing something together for Sundays because it's now the school year's return and we have students that like to sing. Um, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll try to make it so it would be easier for congregations to sing it. Brother Joel is working on getting the organ into something usable uh, to make it even better because when you have organ accompaniment, it is so easy to sing it. Like congregations can sing it so, so easily and it, it makes so much less of an encumbrance. So there's things like that that we can do that working with the limitations of organ placement in this chapel have set us back a little bit. But 
if we could all sing this, it'd be wonderful, where we would just, the choir can start us off, and then we repeat it kind of like how we typically do a responsorial song. And it'd be a wonderful way for everyone to be participating in the liturgical action, singing the proper that is set aside, that is, con that is configured to the liturgy, uh, so we can more participate in Christ's mediation, so that we might be sanctified and also so that we might glorify God through Christ working in us. Pretty cool if we can do that. Do we need to be singing in order to make that happen? Hmm. Not necessarily, uh, but there's more that uh, I'll get into why we, uh, why we sing. And I know we're, we'll probably finish up in 10 minutes, just so you know. By the way, I get in this mode where I talk extremely fast. <laughs> so I, I'm never going to listen to myself on YouTube because I can't stand how fast I talk. <laughs> um, but uh, if you guys can understand me, that's great. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to just you know, stop me. And I know we're an hour into it by now. But feel free to stop me, because uh, I'd like to go a mile a minute. And, uh, but there might be things that I'm just skipping over, and I have no idea. Um, so offertory chant, really cool. Uh, it's not in the missile, but hey, we do it. We can sing it. So we can kind of sing it uh, in its presence in the Mass. Uh, even though we can't speak it. So that's one real good incentive to sing the offertory chant is otherwise you don't get an offertory antiphon. Uh, and then the communion. The communion is similar to the uh, introit. There's four options it gives. Uh, and there's uh, ways of when to sing it, how to sing it. It should accompany, it says, the, uh, uh, the procession of people coming up for communion. Um, so that's pretty cool. And the cool thing about the communion in particular, and I mentioned this earlier, is that the, uh, the communion is typically, it captures a portion of the gospel for the day. Ordinary time, not so much. Unfortunately, the communion antiphons seem to be usually just kind of psalms, and they can be paired really nicely with the text of the gospel, and they, uh, but they're not, at least the past few weeks, have not been segments of the gospel being chanted. But I looked at year A for next year. This is 22nd Sunday in our airtime, year A. And it's from Matthew 16. And uh, this is right after Peter said, you are the Christ, son of the living God. He said, you're, you know, you're Peter. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. And then uh, he tells his disciples he's going to have to die. And Peter says, God forbid. He says, get behind me, Satan. And then he, Jesus says, if any man would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And then if this is sung during communion, it would be sung over and over again, usually interspersed with some words of the Psalms over and over again. If a man wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. How awesome. The, the imagery of coming, processing up to receive our Lord and Holy Communion. And with his words, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. These are the words that accompany our communion with our Lord. The chanting of this is actually a participation, even in just the chanting, in the communion of Christ. There is probably sacramental graces that are being tapped into for the souls that are rightly disposed, and singing the chant in a state of grace, devoutly, lovingly. And those that hear it, that have this in the background, as they're approaching to receive our Lord, their disposition to receive our Lord is hopefully being affected positively. This is not just a sentimental hymn about Jesus being the bread of life. It's not just a, you know, uh, some sort of nice hymn that might just be pulled out of uh, one of the higher quality vernacular collections. It is the words of the gospel now come to life, interspersed with prayer, irrigated with silence. All for the purpose of drawing us into Christ more deeply, having us be sanctified by him, and for us to give ourselves back to him expressing both mediation from heaven to earth and earth to heaven. How wonderful. Cool. <laughs> so question is, uh, why um, the book that we're using is called Simple English Propers. It's a great name. Uh, one question is, why should it be simple? And we saw the difference between the Miserere uh, Miki, uh, how complicated it was, and how it could be a little more challenging to sing and the ease that, of which the other one, and the shortness of it, and how compact it was, despite having lost some of the uh, devotional uh, you know, uh, you know, punch of the, the actual full Latin one. Um, from Sacrosanctum Concilium, it says uh, in Para 34, 
the rites should be distinguished by a noble simplicity. And here it's talking about the, the liturgy overall. That the Roman liturgy has almost always had, been noted, noted to have a noble simplicity. It's not meant to be necessarily overly ornate. Even in its most solemn form, there's something simple about it. And it's a little bit different from the ornateness of the Orthodox liturgy. The rites should be distinguished by a noble simplicity. They should be short, clear, and unencumbered by useless repetitions. They should be within the people's powers of comprehension and normally should not require much explanation. In some ways, although this is talking about the liturgy overall and the, the reforms of the liturgy that they are hoping to undertake, um, you can see how this kind of corresponds to the simplicity of a, a more simple setting of the chant. That by doing this, it's unencumbered by complexities that we might not be ready for at this point. And it draws us in without distracting us by melismas and qualismas and complicated notes and whatnot, but simply the text comes alive a little bit more than it would otherwise. So simplicity is a, is a good thing there. Another question is, why sing it in English? Because I know there's some Latin fans here. And it's, yeah, well, so this is actually from Sacra Santa Cotillium, particular, particular law remaining in force. That is, the laws of the time in 1962 or 3, whenever this document came out, I forget exactly. Particular law remaining in force, the use of the Latin language is to be preserved in the Latin rites. But it goes on to say, But since the use of the mother tongue, whether in the Mass, the administration of the sacraments, or other parts of the liturgy, frequently may be of great advantage to the people, that's you, the limits of its employment may be extended. This will apply in the first place to the readings and directives and to some of the prayers and chants. That it's, they, they envision extending the use of the mother tongue, the, in this case, English, for English speakers, so that it might be a benefit for us. Part of maybe the idea to make it more accessible for a lot of us. It hasn't necessarily happened. And I, I think you could argue that um, keeping things in Latin in some way, unveiling it more through a language we're not quite as used to, actually allows us to enter more fully into the mystery and to come more in contact with the God who speaks to us in the traditional language of the church. But not everyone is ready for that. So it's okay and to extend the use of English, as we do here. English is good. We throw in some Greek in the Kyrie, throw some Latin there with the Gloria on a Sunday and the, and the other ordinaries, but why not have the text, like, not have that extra barrier of having to translate it for ourselves? So and that's something that the church envisioned at that time. That's something they ultimately went and undertook uh, in the liturgical reforms. It's something now we have a liturgy that could be said entirely in English. Uh, for our benefit. So we might as well to try to derive as much benefit out of that as possible. Um, so there you go. That's why it's in English. Uh, why sing it congregationally? Why would I make a point of maybe trying to get the offertory something that we might all try to sing? Maybe tomorrow I'll make the extra effort and print out the offertory so you can read it and go, go along with us. And that way that it could be kind of a back and forth thing and it would be really nice and everyone would be edified. Um, maybe that would work if I remember to do that in time. Uh, so the faithful, here I'll just go straight to the, uh, the uh, highlighted parts. So the faithful might take a more active part in divine worship. Let the Gregorian chant be restored to popular use. I'm going to go to the whole quote. This is from Pius the, the 11th. This is way back. This is 1928. And he's talking here about active part, active participation. What you might hear about a lot from the language of Vatican II about active participation. He took to mean singing Gregorian chant. Primarily, that's what he was thinking of, is singing the chant. Making it accessible to be, make it easy to sing, I think would be perfectly in line with how even Pius XI was approaching it. And then when the church uh, in the Second Vatican Council, it uses this language of uh, uh, fully conscious and active participation. A lot of uh, people will point out that the word for active is probably more fittingly translated as actual. If you say active, we tend to think of activity, activism, and we get caught up in maybe sort of like the Martha effect of prayer. We just have to do everything and we have to just make sure like we're doing stuff. If we do stuff, if we say stuff, if we're like involved, if we're ev everyone's in the sanctuary doing stuff, we're really participating. And the church is like, no, 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 no. Like active participation, like, like know what's going on. Like enter into the silence of the mass. Understand what you are praying. And if you're able to sing, if you have that competence, do it, please. Join the Scola Cantorum. Join the choir. 
you know, participate in the, the ordinary of the Mass that's sung every single week, even when it changes like it does in some places. You know, make a point of integrating yourself in that, but not for the purpose of mere activity, but for the purpose of being interiorly drawn through your external participation into a deeper mystery, to be drawn up into Christ's mediation so that you and the rest of the church might be sanctified and that you might glorify God. That's what the church envisioned by actual participation. And one way that can be accomplished is through the simplifying, the Englishifying of the propers of the church uh, so that it can be sung in the mass that are fitted to liturgical action, albeit maybe not as beautiful or as ornate and as deep as what we could be doing, at least a movement in that direction. Ultimately, we're not ever really going to be satisfied liturgically here. That's a basic truth. We're not, as, as perfect as the liturgy might be, it's never going to be entirely perfect. And in some ways, it's a false to think that we can make it perfect. We start grasping after this idea of ceremonial perfection, as if only God can give us grace if we do everything so right. No, that's not how it works. We can't grasp after grace. We can't just force God to, to, to uh, give us the, his help because, and his love because we did something right. That's, that's the height of perfectionism. That's like straight up Pelagianism. We can't be Pelagian litur uh, liturgists. There are some out there. Uh, we should instead be, uh, let, allow the liturgy to form us, to be receptive to the liturgy. And so far as we might learn about the fruits of it and to enter more fully into it, we might be able to draw more benefit for ourselves and to glorify God all the more. And then in anticipation of being drawn up ultimately into the heavenly liturgy. At the eschaton, when the heavenly city of Jerusalem descends from the clouds and we're drawn up into the worship of all the angels and saints, that liturgy will be perfect. I won't be perfect because we made it that way by minute attention to details and OCD and uh, liturgical rubrics. It'd be that way because of the holiness of our lives, which the liturgy is trying to affect in us. We can't reverse it. The liturgy should form us. We don't form the liturgy. Hence the reason why we should go back to what the church gives us and learn to receive from it in whatever way we can in order to properly participate in the mediation of Christ's priesthood so that we might be sanctified and God might be glorified. There's a lot more that could be said about what happened since the Second Vatican Council, why the propers are not sung, lack of availability of resources being a big thing, liturgical minimalism being a big thing. I mean, you don't necessarily need to be a liturgical maximalist doing everything you possibly can, but like stripping everything down to its most, you know, sh the shortest form is not always a good thing. Um, sometimes there's liturgical minimalism combined with uh, the, the faithful who want to have more, so they infuse more, uh, you know, popular um, kind of like, you know, like, I don't know, poppy songs into the mass because they want more, but they don't know how to do it because they're, they're not being properly formed. And there's a lot of reasons what that, why that happened. And, you know, liturg uh, liturgy, liturgy directors and choir directors are like notoriously obstinate and priests aren't always well formed. And there's a lot of reasons why that could be the case. Um, you know, and in here we try to sometimes, I mean, I make a point maybe uh, not to do as much as I can because uh, I like the propers. Uh, you know, so we have on Sunday Mass at 11 and maybe some other Masses, depending if we can or not. Um, but it's something worth moving towards and worth understanding. And so that when we do go to, into Mass, we might be able to more fully and actually participate in it. So uh, that's probably good enough for now. It's 8.15. Um, if you have any questions first, uh, anything that you're interested in. Uh, if you need to, you know, wait until this is on YouTube and then slow it down to about half speed, <laughs> I understand. Is Gregorian chant only Latin? Not necessarily. So, like, looking at something like the offertory for tomorrow, it is, it's, Gregor it's Gregorian chant notation, so it's only four lines, it's square notes, because it's cooler that way. Uh, <laughs> There's more reasons, I know. Um, it can be other languages, too. You, you can adapt Gregorian chants. You can adapt the melodies, the, the psalm tones. You can adapt that to English, sometimes more successfully than others. This book that we use um, to give us this uh, does a good job of maintaining the feel of the original Latin one, uh, at the same time simplifying it. 
um, and, but also fitting it better for the English words. There are some basic things about English, such as the way we accent. We put a lot of, um, uh, Latin is a, da, da, uh, where Latin is more as a da, 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 da kind of language. English is more of like, da, 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 da. It's more percussive, and there's a lot more final emphases, uh, accents on last notes, and, and it, it works differently. And so you can't take one part of the word and just like, oh, well, it's the second syllable of this word, and same thing, same length of syllables as in the Latin, so I'll just make that really ornate, just like the Latin. It just doesn't work the same way. So you have to adapt. And usually there's a simplification that goes on uh, in order to make that happen. But yeah, you can do other languages, and other languages than English, too, of course. In the quote that you had up there um, right before, yeah. So when he references at the very top um, the parts proper to the people, so I don't know what those parts are. What are the parts that were proper to the people? Like we're going to be restored to pop popular and the parts proper to the people. That would be the parts that I'm assuming, like you have the priest prayers that are the priest prayers, mm -hmm. the collect, the, the prayer over the offerings, the, uh, the preface, um, and then the Eucharistic prayer. So you know, you know, uh, par excellence, the Eucharistic prayer is the central constitutive part of the Roman rite. Um, he's not talking about that necessarily, but the parts that are available to the people. So the ones that like a choir can sing would be something like that. Or like it wouldn't be meaning in this case the readings because at this point the readings would have been sung or, uh, by uh, someone who was an acolyte or a, a deacon uh, in a solemn high mass or by the priest himself uh, in a sung mass where it's just the priest or just spoken in masses where it's just a spoken mass. Uh, but it wouldn't be the, uh, the faithful doing that. But it'd be more like the propers because everyone could sing that technically. So um, just a question about the same part. Um, first of all, thank you for the talk. It was very inspiring and edifying. But where he says, let Gregorian chant be restored, um, when did when did it go out of Sort of, yeah. Was that during the Renaissance with polyphonic music? Or? There's probably different places where Gregorian chant lived well. It's certain monasteries, um, probably the Kalina monasteries had a great impact on that because they, they prayed in common, they did the Gregorian chant, and they survived. And it was only in the late 19th century that you sort of had a resurgence of that monastic movement to pray in common, especially the Liturgy of the Albers, but also the Mass. And uh, of note is uh, the Monastery of Salem, stands out because they not only started praying these Gregorian chants that had fallen out of use, but they also did a lot of scholarly work to collect them together and make additions for other, other, uh, other Catholics, other monasteries, others. Uh, so the Salem editions, editions are like the, the, the standards. Some might have different variations. I mean, I have a, I have a chant um, uh, of, uh, from the 15th century on my wall in my room, just randomly for fun. And it's, it's not exactly the same as the same chant that it's sung uh, now, but it's very, very close. Uh, it's cool to see, like, wow, it's, like, we probably are very, like, I could sing it actually on my wall. It's really nice. Uh, so, but that, that movement of Salem was, was huge there. The liturgical movement in general was this movement to understand the liturgy more. The people started buying hand missiles so they can go to Mass and they can read along what the priest was praying. So that even though they couldn't hear or understand maybe the readings, or the prayers of the priest, they can read it. And then that would be a more conscious participation in what was going on. And that kind of grew and grew. In the United States, it grew very well. In the 1950s, I think in a lot of, a lot of places, we're living the liturgical movement very well. Europe, not as much so, actually, I think, overall. Um, so what Pius XI is probably addressing is mostly like probably the, the situation in Europe, and uh, hopefully the entire Catholic world, to get them back to Gregorian chant because what you had in most places was either no singing, or bad singing, or just hymns, and it wasn't, or motets, maybe beautiful polyphony, but it was not a little bit disjointed from the mass, and it was like, well, no, Gregorian chant. Let's go back to that, that, that works. Uh, so that might have been where that was coming from at that point in time. So do you have to sing the offertory hymn? I usually don't, even when I'm at a normal parish. Oh, you can do whatever you want. Oh. <laughs> it's the liturgy. <laughs> no, I'm, I mean, 
you know, never one's ever, as, there's very little instructions about what the faith will have to do. I'm sure people, like, a lot of, uh, a lot of pastors, a lot of, a lot of different churches want people to be singing whatever they're singing. Because it's, it's helpful, you know, people along with it. If it's, people are singing, like, half-heartedly, some are and some aren't, it's noticeable. Like, you're better off, like, it's better off, like, not having, like, in a choir, if someone stops singing, it's worse than if they were not there at all. Because they're like a vacuum that sucks up sound, rather than uh, actually helping at all and producing good sound. No, you're never required necessarily, and especially if you don't find it like particularly efficacious. You know, like it might maybe it's not conducive to you singing well. And uh, in seminary, we sang a lot of really good tunes, like the hymn tunes were excellent, but the words were just like so watered down. I just took it as an opportunity to practice singing. <laughs> That sounds bad, but yeah. <laughs> Is there any particular reason why these were just right was removed from being preparatory right to now penitential right? Because most people oh, I don't know. experience the spurgeous right. They have no idea what And I've is. heard different variations. Is it spurgeous right is when the, uh, the priest would, uh, would um, bless people with the water at the beginning of Mass, or before Mass even. It used to be before, and now it's in the Mass, but it's very optional, and you don't get it except for... Easter, so you don't get hit with holy water as much. Any Sunday, <laughs> you, you, you could. I mean, like, I don't know the reasoning for that. That would be something so in the... Whenever I go to Precious Blood, I mean, the majority of the congregation sings the Aspergers. Yeah, isn't that cool? Around me singing it. Yeah, is that, that's yeah, awesome. Like, that's something we... My heart. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of things like that we kind of miss out on now. Uh, and it's hard to, like, what battles do you fight? What do you try to force back in there? And how do you, like, how do you inform people besides waiting for an, an August lecture series uh, from the oratory to tell people about something in order to tell. Like, there's just so much stuff. Uh, and it's like, just even studying the liturgy is a great fruit to our spiritual lives. Because we see how, what it means to, to believe as a Catholic, because we see what it means to pray as a Catholic, and then how to live accordingly. And it should be very formative in that way, and we don't usually find that to be the case. So, and insofar as we can, what we can do to support priests and support, you know, uh, music ministries and anything we could do to like not be antagonist, not be overly critical, I'm sure that would go a long way uh, towards helping. If you say the right thing in a jerky kind of way, you're just making sure that that right thing is never going to get done. So being, you know, treading carefully and always, always uh, living charity, you know, like don't be a jerk. Uh, and, <laughs> So that's a good principle, I guess, overall, <laughs> especially dealing with liturgy. Yeah. <laughs> I was just curious if you, I mean, you mentioned silence uh, a, a few times, and I was curious if, if you have thoughts on uh, that. It's one thing that, that seems to have uh, been another thing that seems to have been kind of left out uh, often in the ordinary form is that in, is more periods of silence um, compared to like the extraordinary form. Did you have any thoughts on, on those, yeah. where that can be? So I think the church is very pro-silence. You look at the general instruction on the Roman Missal, which is for the ordinary form, it's like there should be silence. Like when the priest says, let us pray, it says there should follow after that a period of silence. It doesn't say how long. It could be very short. It doesn't have, you don't like, but and it, you don't have to necessarily under pain of mortal sin to have to do that necessarily. It's just, but you like it allows for it. It wants that, encourages silence, like, um, and chant in some ways sort of encourages that as well. Like, it's not triumphant usually. It usually, like the way each phrase kind of should it should grow and then settle down, kind of like how we typically stop talk. We get we talk faster and talk slower, and begin, you know, which is like, and that's a very natural. And it lends itself to a repose. Chant ideally does that. I like it when, like, you know, doing a, uh, the community antiphon, and just like getting to the end of it, and just like getting soft. I like that effect. It's like a, like reposing now with the Lord who we just received in Holy Communion, leaving that time for silence. So it's not something that ends abruptly, and then like, like that abruptness. It still resonates out. Not maybe not acoustically, but at least like interiorly you know, abrupt ends and, like, triumphant organ hymns might just, you know, not kind of kill that space. But chant lends itself to that. And in the chant itself, like, there should be kind of uh, pregnant pauses. Like, every time you sing a psalm, 
uh, in Liturgy of the Hours, there's an asterisk, there should be at least, after the, the line. And if you sing it, you should sing the, uh, sing the psalm like this. And then you do the next line. And then you do the next line, it's pause. And then you do the next line. And like, it's, the, the pause is actually built into it. It's really hard to practice. It's really hard to give that space to the silence, to let, to let the, kind of the words of the psalm ring out. And the liturgy, the same kind of thing. Cool. Any other questions? You guys want to try an offertory antiphon to close things up? <laughs> Here. I'll sing it once, and we'll try singing it twice, and then we'll end in a blessing, because this counts as prayer, kind of. Oh, Lord, look down in order to help. Uh, I'm going to start again. Oh, Lord, look down in order to help me. Let them be covered with confusion and shame. Who seek after my soul to take it away. Let me try it if you are comfortable. Oh, Lord. you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks. Thanks.